Ah, greetings, everyone. Greetings, everyone. What a, and Professor Elsa, a gracias, and a Sergi from Spain, gracias for hosting me and, and letting me be part of this wonderful uh, event, an historic, historic event. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Osaka, Japan, halfway around the world. Uh, I live in Osaka, and then we also live in Honolulu. Uh, but as you know, I'm the senior research scientist at the Michigan Mixed Methods Research Program, and I work with them on projects, and I work with them on workshops, and uh, it's just a delight to be here. And Hopefully, uh, you will pick up some new ideas about mixed methods research. I'm going to uh, talk about the foundations and some of the best practices of mixed methods research. And, uh, so this presentation will be maybe oh, 50 minutes or 45 or 50, 55 minutes long. And then uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions. And uh, Professor Elsa from Colombia will be uh, monitoring those questions and present a few questions to me from you, uh, the most important audience. And I, I'm just delighted with the turnout uh, all over the world for this webinar. So uh, the Latin American Mixed Methods Association has really done a good job in organizing this. I want to talk uh, about a few thoughts about my background, uh, make some comments about mixed methods research in Latin America, uh, provide a short introduction to mixed methods research, and then the, the primary part of this presentation will be on some of the best practices to use if you're doing a mixed method study. And so I'll give reasons for each one of these practices and specific examples. So a few thoughts about my own background here. Uh, you know, I was one of the beginning, uh, the, the, the founders of, of mixed methods research over 30 years ago. There were about nine people in different countries uh, that all came to the same conclusion that it was time to start bringing together quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, we were not in touch with each other. Uh, there were people in sociology and management and in nursing and in the health sciences. Uh, but it basically began about 30 years ago. And uh, during these 30 years, I directed the Office of Mixed Methods Research at Nebraska. And I helped to found the, the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. And then I helped to establish the Mixed Methods International Research Association. And I have this really strong interest in international work. And so I was a Fulbright senior scholar at uh, South Africa and Th Thailand. And I helped then in 2015, develop the mixed methods research program at the University of Michigan. And if you haven't gone to a workshop at Michigan, you should certainly think about it. There are about four or five workshops a year and they are online, of course, right now during the pandemic. But uh, uh, the workshops are definitely worthwhile if you're doing a mixed methods project and you need to bring in some of the latest ideas. I'm also providing consulting services out of Osaka and Honolulu. Uh, I'm probably best known for some of the books that I've written. I've really written books on research methods in three areas. Uh, up the top on the left, you see my books on research design, general research design, and then educational research. And then on the right, you see my two books in qualitative research, uh, a beginning book called The Essential, 30 Essential Skills, and the more advanced book, uh, Qualitative Inquiry and Research Design. And down on the left, uh, you see my two mixed methods books. The book on the right, the concise introduction is way, the way I would recommend that you start thinking about mixed methods research. It's a short book. It can be read by an English speaking person in two to three hours. It's 
very inexpensive from Sage publication. And it really provides an orientation to mixed methods research. It's based on my lectures at Harvard uh, that I gave in uh, 2015. And then on the, the left of that is the larger book, 400 page book, Designing and, and Connecting Mixed Methods Research, which is more of the advanced presentation of mixed methods research. And so take a look at some of these books if you can. I'm not the only person writing on mixed methods. There's probably 30 or 40 books out there on this field. I just thought I would talk a little bit about how I've been presenting around the world and how mixed methods has taken off. Of course, in England and the United States were the two places probably where it really began to get uh, some development uh, these 30 years ago. But uh, I've presented in South Africa and in Europe and Germany. I was in Germany, uh, Australia, of course, in Tokyo and in Japan, there's quite a bit of interest. There's the Japan Society for Mixed Methods Research, which has really developed uh, rapidly in the last two or three years. A lot of interest in Thailand. Uh, we spoke in, I spoke in Singapore, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, in Indonesia. Uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, in uh, Trinidad and Jamaica. And of course, now in uh, Latin America, South America. So you can see this is a worldwide movement of mixed methods research. And I s often say it's one of the latest methodologies. So you want to think about using it in your research project. Just a few thoughts about mixed methods research in Latin America. Uh, I went into the literature and of course, people are writing mixed method studies in South America and Latin America. Uh, I pulled out this article up on the left uh, from Brazil on women's struggles of land rights. Uh, then uh, in Ecuador about research methods, courses that are coming along. And in Peru, uh, a, a health related uh, study. Uh, then from Brazil, another study on mixed methods research and geo-referenced information. Uh, another study on neighborhood disadvantages. Uh, I want to point out this one on the right down at the bottom. It's a mixed methods study published in the leading mixed methods journal, uh, mixed methods in studies on women's struggles for land rights in Brazil. So I know there's quite a bit of interest in, in developing mixed methods research in South America and Latin America areas of the, of the world right now. Uh, one area that has developed considerably in is, is the Caribbean chapter of the Mixed Methods Research Association. And I see what uh, uh, Professor Elsa and Professor Sergio are doing with this webinar is, is, is an introduction to the field and it certainly can develop. Now, what happened in the Caribbean, oh, maybe five years ago, it's a short period of time, uh, Dr. Lorraine Cook at the University of the West Indies was a key individual taking the lead in developing mixed methods research. And she helped to organize international conferences uh, that have been held in uh, Jamaica, been held in Trinidad, uh, she then formed an advisory committee to help advise the development of the field of mixed methods in the Caribbean chapter. Uh, then they formally uh, assumed chapter status in the Mixed Methods International Re Research Association, MMIRA. So they became a major chapter in the world. And then they started sending scholars uh, to workshops at Michigan. And we've had uh, their scholars as, as visiting uh, professors in our Michigan Mixed Methods program. And then the latest uh, adventure is to create a specific journal on Caribbean mixed methods research. And so they've launched that. So this is, this is how uh, I see South America, the Latin American orientation 
the Latin American Mixed Methods Association developing over time? Well, usually when I present, I, I give a short introduction to what is mixed methods research. Uh, some people have been reading, reading articles or reading books, but many people are new to this field. It is a, a fairly new methodology in the last 30 years. I can tell you how this methodology is developed because I've been part of this experience over the 30 years. And uh, back in 1985 to 1990 is the founding period. Uh, as I said, different disciplines, different countries, uh, we were all working to develop this, this new field as a methodology. But then the book came out in 1998 on uh, mixed methods as a methodology from Tashikori and Tedley. And it began, began to pull in the field. But by 2003, we had the SAGE Handbook on Mixed Methods Research, which really began to develop the entire, there were maybe 25 chapters in this handbook. Uh, so they began to map the entire field. By 2007, we had the journal of Mixed Methods Research. So journal was the next step. And then the, the US federal government became involved. The National Institute of Health commissioned a panel, and I was on that panel to come up with the best practices of mixed methods research in 2011. And then the association was formed in 2013. And then from this international association, they had uh, an international meeting every other year, but on the off years, uh, they would have regional conferences. Uh, you know, Tokyo, uh, New Zealand, uh, Trinidad, uh, South America, or South uh, Africa, excuse me, South Africa. Uh, then the federal government also became interested in developing some standards. Of, of using mixed methods research in the health sciences. So the National Institute of Health in America put together a task force. It actually started in 2011. And then we now have uh, professional associations involved in coming up with standards like the American Psychological Association. So you can see here with my boxes at the bottom of this slide, this is how a methodology gets developed. Uh, people write books, they create a journal, uh, there's federal involvement, funding, an international association, a training program is developed, and then some standards. And uh, so I, I think that in uh, Latin America, the Latin American Association for Mixed Method Research, you may follow a similar path as this. Well, what is mixed methods research? And here's a very simple model to illustrate it. Mixed methods research is, is, is if you have an opportunity to collect both quantitative data and qualitative data. For example, conduct a survey and then also uh, collect interviews. And then, and then you bring these two databases together as a man in South Africa once said to me, he said, this is like two hands coming together, John, to form a stronger bond. So we're gonna bring these two databases together. And from this bringing together, we're gonna to gain insight beyond just what we learn from analyzing our quantitative or qualitative data. You know, this is what mixed methods is. And this slide kind of shows uh, my definition of mixed methods research. Uh, you need to start by gathering quantitative and qualitative data to answer both quantitative and qualitative research questions. And then you select a mixed methods design, which is a set of procedures for organizing your questions, your data collection, your data analysis interpretation. And what you then do is you bring the two databases together. The term is integration, integrating the data in the design. There's different ways to integrate that I'm going to talk about. 
And then from that integration, we draw conclusions or inferences. And we may use what's called a joint display table that I'm going to explain to look at what we conclude from bringing these two databases together. And then we also uh, draw from these inferences insight uh, uh, beyond what we learned from our just our quantitative and qualitative data. So as my colleague at Michigan, uh, Professor Mike Fetter says, one plus one equals three. Quantitative plus qualitative equals three. It's more than just two. You have added insight. And to understand that definition, it's helpful to know how I'm looking at these two databases. Some people say quantitative is numbers and qualitative is stories. And I think that works a little bit, but uh, I see quantitative as close ended where you ask a question and have responses. And the close ended quantitative could be on instruments, checklists, uh, document data. Qualitative is more open ended, where you ask a general question and listen to the participant give a response through interviews, or you can observe, or documents, or even the many social media possibilities now are part of qualitative data using, uh, you know, text messages or Facebook posts or website information. So we have this array of social media qualitative data so the idea is to bring these two databases together in a design so this is a design of an explanatory sequential project if you look down at the left we're going to start with a research question and we're then going to collect and analyze quantitative data you know we might collect survey information, looking at the health issue of cholesterol. We're going to have a theory that helps us form this survey. And then we're going to collect and analyze qualitative data as a follow-up. Now, doing a survey is important, but we only get statistical results. So let's follow up qualitatively with some interviews with some patients and uh, dive into the results in more detail to get the personal perspectives. And then finally to make an interpretation. So you see a design consists of these parts. We've got a question, we've got data collection, uh, we've got theory, we've got interpretation. That's what I mean by a mixed methods design. Now integration means what we're going to do is bring these two databases together. There's different ways we can do this. We can actually merge them together, put them together in a, a single table, or we can do them sequentially, which is the second one here. We can start with that survey, just as I showed you, and follow up with some interviews and use the qualitative interviews to help explain the survey results. Or we might integrate by starting qualitatively and then following up quantitatively. So you see it starts differently. In this second one, we start quantitatively. And in the third, we start qualitatively. So these are some ways in which we can integrate, bring the two databases together. And as I said, we, we draw inferences from combining these two databases. So an example would be, let's put together a table that has our quantitative scores on the left, and then followed up by qualitative themes, and then our interpretation in the third column. This is called a joint display table. I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. But uh, we can draw inferences. You know, how did the people who scored high respond to the themes differently than the people who scored low. So this is a joint display table. Well, before you start, 
you need to think about some basic questions here. Uh, you do need some skills in both quantitative and qualitative research. And if you are strong in qualitative research, then find someone that is strong in quantitative to team with. You have to be able to collect both forms of data. Uh, I think you need to read a little bit about mixed methods. You need to read an introduction to mixed methods research or one of the many books, or even look at one of those mixed methods articles in South America, in Brazil and Ecuador and Peru and other places that I've mentioned. Uh, reading some books and journal articles is very, very important to understand this. Uh, you also need a question that maybe is best answered by both collecting open-ended qualitative data as well as closed-ended quantitative data, where collecting one of them would not give you as complete a picture as both together. And this, this is a, a good sophisticated research approach. It will take time and resources, but it's well, well worth, worth the effort. And you'll be positioning yourself for using the latest research methodology approach that's available in the social and health sciences. Now I wanna to turn to 10 best practices for you to think about including in your mixed method study. Uh, the first six, I'm going to go over in some detail. Um, and the last four, I will go over briefly, but you'll be aware of these. And uh, really, I've been thinking about putting together this list of best practices for several years. I remember back in the 1990s, I had a study on structural equation modeling, and I went to a specialist. And he said, well, John, this is a good study, but you're missing some of the best practices of structural equation modeling. And he told me what those were, and I put them in my article, and then the article was, was published. So I think it's important to bring into your research some of the latest, most advanced practices in mixed methods research to make it sophisticated. Well, as I said, I've been thinking about coming up with a short list of best practices for some time. And I think this really came home to me when I began working, uh, you see it the, up here at the left, on the NIH best practices of mixed methods in the health sciences. Our committee first met in 2011, and then this list has been updated. Uh, but this is the National Institute of Health guidance on what constitutes a good mixed methods project. And there's a table in this guide. It's, it's, if you were to Google this, NIH best practices and mixed methods in health sciences, you'll find this report because it was placed up on a website and it became so popular within two weeks in 2011, after we posted it, there were over 20,000 hits on this website. And it's become one of the most popular uh, uh, websites for the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences at NIH. And they have, we have a table, uh, actually a checklist at the end of this report of the best practices to include if you're writing an application to NIH for funding or if you're reviewing. So this, this is a very important step towards coming up with some of the best practices. Then more recently, the American Psychological Association has developed standards for mixed methods research. And you see the citation here on the left and on the right, our journal article in the American Psychologist. Uh, you can find this on the internet. Uh, this is our report talking about the best practices for qualitative and mixed methods research. 
And there's a table in this report specifically for mixed methods research that talks about some of the standards that should be used when you put together a journal article for an American Psychological Association journal. There, there are over 400 journals sponsored by APA. And if you've had a chance to look at the publication manual, the style manual, the most recent edition, I believe it's the seventh edition, uh, you will see now a discussion about the standards and mixed methods research. This is a historic development because throughout the years, the publication style manual has had nothing on qualitative and mixed methods research. And now there's a complete section on standards. So this is going out around the world and really helping to promote the use of mixed methods research. I've also been informed by the writings of Sergi and uh, Jose from Spain and uh, their articles that have been published re recently, 2017 and 2019, on uh, standards of quality in mixed methods research. And they have some helpful lists in their publications as well as to what you might include in your mixed method study. So these three sources of information have been extremely instrumental in helping me to think about the practices that you, I would encourage you to use in your mixed methods project. So I divided these 10 practices into two categories. Uh, first of all, must-see practices. These are ones that I think are really essential to put into your mixed methods project. And then below those, that's the first six, then the, the last four, I call these optional but important practices. Um, think about including the optional practices as well. Uh, and you'll have a very rigorous mixed methods, sophisticated project worthy of publication in a an international journal. So on these first must-see practices, first of all, name your mixed methods design. You know, tell me the name of the mixed methods procedures, your design that you're using in your study. I think this is very important. Now you could turn to many of the books on mixed methods research. Uh, to get the names that are being used today. In my book with Plano Clark, we have chapter three, and we give the names of three core designs, convergent, explanatory sequential design, and exploratory sequential design. I'm going to explain those in just a minute. And then these core designs are embedded or included within complex procedures or frameworks. So for example, chapter four talks about the complex designs, a mixed methods, intervention or experimental design, comparative case study design, evaluation design, a participatory action research design. So here are some names that you could use for your project in terms of designs and maybe to help you think about these design possibilities i put together this little table of a diagram of the three core designs in this convergent design what we're going to do here is we're going to take our qualitative data and our quantitative data we're actually going to merge it bring it together in a table so that we can compare what we learn from our open-ended qualitative data and our closed-ended quantitative data. A convergent design, very popular. The second one is an explanatory sequential design. This is a design where we're going to start by gathering quantitative data, you know, on instruments or documents or observations. And then we're going to follow it up sequentially with gathering qualitative data. Now we use this design really to understand the quantitative 
results in more depth. The quantitative results are going to give us significant differences, p-values, confidence intervals, effect sizes, but we really don't know why these relationships might exist. And so we're going to explain them by gathering qualitative data as a follow-up. I say this explanatory sequential design is a very, very popular graduate student research design, especially in America and other places around the world. The third design is an exploratory sequential design. We're going to explore first by gathering qualitative data. And then we're going to build, oh, say, a survey instrument or experimental procedures, or maybe even a website that then we test out quantitatively in the final phase. Now, what this means is that the survey instrument, shall we say, is going to be sensitive to the population and the sample we're studying because we begin by gathering qualitative data to understand the problem. Now, this design is very popular internationally in global research. You know, my colleagues at Harvard were using this design to study issues of uh, families in uh, North Africa, where they would first go in and gather qualitative community interviews and then redesign the Western instruments to best fit the population. I often say, you know, you just can't drop into Rwanda, a Western depression instrument. No, you need to start first and talk to pe people about how they view depression and then modify your instrument. That's the same in Japan too. We can't just drop in some of the Western instruments into Japan. We need to think about how people respond personally to issues and then revise our instruments. So these are the three core designs. Now moving to those complex designs, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put those core designs into a larger process or framework, such as an experiment. So in an experiment, which you see in the box in the center here, we might start with some qualitative interviews before the experiment. We're gonna embed an exploratory sequential core design into the experiment. Or we might do an experiment where while the experiment is running, we're gathering qualitative data as well. We're going to embed a convergent design in the experiment. Or a really popular approach in health sciences these days is to gather qualitative data after the experiment or intervention to help explain those results. You know, why did these why did the treatment work to explain the qualitative, the quantitative results in more detail? So this is embedding an explanatory sequential design. So this is what I mean by a complex design. What we're doing is we're embedding a core design. We're putting a core design within a larger framework. I want to give you more examples of this in a moment. Well, you can see uh, my second point, best practice, is to have a diagram of your procedures. And and you can see that I've been illustrating mixed methods by using some diagrams here. It simplifies the complex procedures used in mixed methods research so that the project can be easily understood. And this, this idea came forward maybe 15 years ago as federal US agencies were reviewing applications. And they said, John, this is complex, but we need, wouldn't it be helpful to have a diagram of our procedures? I began thinking about, you know, well, how would I draw a picture, a di diagram of the procedures? I'm gonna give you a couple of illustrations here. First, uh, with these core designs. This first one is a convergent design. So I'm gonna put on a piece of paper and I can draw this in PowerPoint or in Word or in a drawing software program. 
my quantitative and qualitative data. That's the two core elements. And in a convergent design, I'm gonna bring these two databases together. One thing that's helpful is to have research questions or aims on each part in this diagram. So my quantitative aim might be like, I'm doing a study of aging to determine, to explain the determinants, what, ex, what explains aging through a survey. And then aim two would be my qualitative aim to explore the personal experiences with aging. And aim three to develop a complex understanding, which is really my mixed methods aim. So this is a convergent mixed method design diagram and I can also put onto this diagram a timeline of when I'm going to be collecting and analyzing these, these data, this data. Um, this is really helpful, uh, not only to have a diagram for a journal article, an application for funding, to present to your graduate committee if you're doing a mixed methods uh, master's thesis or dissertation. I want to show you another diagram here. Uh, this is going to be a diagram of an explanatory sequential design. Remember that design is where I start quantitatively and then follow up with qualitative data. So I'm going to connect these two databases and I'm going to use the qualitative to explain the quantitative results. Again, I can put quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods aims above each one of the, the parts of this. And so this is a diagram of an explanatory sequential mixed method design. I've already shown you that design several times. And then we can also have a, uh, a timeline at the bottom. Now, what you're, you're finding in the publications of mixed methods research are many diagrams of the designs. In fact, it's become a rather standard practice in the mixed methods field. You need a diagram. Now, if you're doing a complex design, uh, let's say you're putting a core design into a participatory action research study or in an experimental study or evaluation project. Here are the steps in drawing this design. First, list the steps in your process. What are the steps in the experiment or the evaluation? Identify in those steps where you can collect both quantitative and qualitative data. And then these places where you can collect both forms of data, they become an opportunity for you to have a core mixed methods design, identify the type of core design. Well, let me show you a picture here. Uh, a participatory action research study. So that's a study basically where you're doing a project in the community and you involve the community members in helping you to design the various aspects of your project. So drawing a diagram, a mixed methods diagram of this procedure, uh, first of all, this is drawn from Ivan Kova's book on action research. And she talks about the steps in conducting a participatory action research study, diagnosing the environment, reconnaissance, planning, uh, acting, evaluation, and monitoring. Okay, these, this is the first step. List your steps in the process that you're using. In this case, participatory action research. Then look at the, at the steps where you have an opportunity to collect both quantitative and qualitative data. Like right here in the reconnaissance stage, you have the opportunity. So this could be a core design, could be a convergent core design. A look at other boxes. Ah, over here, we have an opportunity to collect and analyze both quantitative and qualitative data. 
So this gives us the opportunity to have another core design. So what we're doing is we are, are embedding or including within a larger process, mixed methods research. This is the complex mixed methods design for a participatory action research study. Okay, now let me move on to the third one here. Advance a rationale for why you're using mixed methods research. You know, mixed methods is still new and people need to understand it, uh, need to understand why you're using it. Uh, I think the reasons that you can write into your project relate to the specific project and a little bit about yourself. So about the project, one reason using mixed methods is, is neither quantitative research or qualitative alone is really sufficient to adequately address the research problem. And, and by combining these two databases, you can get more, more insight into the problem beyond the quantitative and qualitative results. You could use these two rationales in your project feel free to borrow exactly what I've said here. Now, in terms of other reasons for wanting to use mixed methods research, well, I see it as one of the latest, most recent methodologies that, as you can see, is, is caught on around the world. Uh, and so when you do your research, you're using one of the latest procedures uh, in the social and health sciences. Um, perhaps you've read books and articles on mixed methods research. So you have a foundation in conducting this type of a study. You have experiences. And also your advisor or colleagues are supportive of your use of mixed methods research or your field is supportive of mixed methods research. So here you have five different rationales that you can put into your project. It's important to tell a reader why you're using mixed methods research. Integration. You saw in those steps how integration was an important part. We're putting the two databases together. It's a central concept. You need to use that word in integration and actually have some statements about how integration was accomplished. So for example, if you have a convergent design, remember this is where we're bringing quantitative and qualitative data together to compare the data, to validate the data, to look for differences in how people talk about a topic quantitatively and qualitatively. Integration occurs at this stage where we're actually merging the two databases. In that explanatory sequential design, what we're doing in integration is to me is where does the quantitative and qualitative data actually connect or bump up against each other? In the explanatory sequential design, our integration resides right here. We gather quantitative data and then we follow up with qualitative. We're integrating the two databases. We need to talk about this. And then exploratory sequential design, integration. You know, we start qualitatively and collect qualitative data, and then we build some type of a quantitative measurement assessment, like a survey or experimental activities or even new variables. The integration is between the, the quantitative uh, results and the design of a quantitative assessment instrument or activities. So integration lies right here between these two points. You can say in your project, I'm going to first collect qualitative data, uh, analyze the results, come up with themes, and then use the themes to design uh, a survey that is grounded in the views of participants. That is culturally adapted and sensitive to the population. You see, I just gave an integration statement for an exploratory sequential design. 
that you could use. And these complex designs, you know, integration occurs where you put the quantitative and qualitative together. You know, I showed you in that participatory action research project, the, the circle of steps, and there were places where both quantitative and qualitative were being combined. So you're integrating at specific steps in your complex process. This is an example of a program evaluation. Uh, next one, which is really important, from the integration, draw conclusions about what not only the quantitative results tell us in your study and your qualitative results, but what does the integration tell us? What are the new conclusions that we can come from from merging these two databases? We call these uh, meta inferences because there are inferences beyond the quantitative and qualitative inferences. There are meta inferences. So I put together a little diagram here of the process. So you analyze both the quantitative and qualitative data uh, within a design. You, you analyze and collect it, you put it within a design. Then you represent the results in a joint display. Now this is going to be a, a place where we can actually see the integration. And then from this joint display, we draw meta inferences. And then finally indicate the value of these meta inferences uh, for, for using mixed methods research. And I've spoken a little bit about a joint display. Well, here's an example of one for convergent design. You see, what I've done here is I've put together a table that organizes both the qualitative themes up at the top on the horizontal axis and the quantitative scores on the vertical axis. And then within the cells, I can put quotes or I can put numbers. And um, then I have a column for inferences where I can draw insight across rows or I can draw inferences across columns. For example, uh, I could take theme one and see how people who score high, medium, and low responded differently to theme one, draw an inference and gain insight as to how that would help me understand the problem better. So join display plays are very popular. There's some great articles uh, by, by Tim Gutterman, my colleague at Michigan, on joint displays. And you're seeing more and more of these joint displays reported in the mixed methods literature. The joint display is a way to present and analyze the integration of the two databases. And in fact, uh, Dr. Fetter's book from Michigan, the Mixed Methods Research Workbook, talks about different integration techniques uh, and how some strategies to address them. You know, you can look for, uh, does the quantitative and qualitative data complement each other? Does it help expand? Uh, there's an entire chapter on using joint displays and how you actually draw conclusions from a table like I've just shown you. And finally, once you've got these meta inferences, uh, talk about in your study the value that mixed methods adds. You can understand your problem at a deeper level. You can see that maybe the quantitative or qualitative by themselves are insufficient. Um, collecting both forms of data are, are important. Finally, uh, the sixth one. Make your philosophical position known. We bring a philosophical position to all of our research. Uh, this is especially important in the social sciences. I go back to a book by Thomas Kuhn, where he talked about identifying your philosophy or worldview for your research. So I suggest that you make your philosophy or worldview specific in your research project. And your worldview or your philosophy is based upon, according to Kuhn, 
your training and your experiences. You know, you're trained in a certain way as, as a psychologist and you have experiences working as a psychologist. This shapes how you look at problems, what methods to use, what conclusions to draw, how you publish your work. This then shapes your worldview. Uh, and there are, there are various articles on the, the different components of a worldview, like reality and values and how you write up a study. And then put into your article, your mixed method study, a discussion about the personal worldview that you bring to, the co to your project. You know, I do think that nurses, for example, are shaped by their training and their experiences to do certain types of research. Psychologists are trained differently. Educators are trained differently. It's important to have a worldview. And I listed on this slide just some of the possible worldviews that you may have heard about, post-positivist, constructivist, participatory, critical theory, pragmatic. And I wonder, in the Latin American context, what are the worldviews? Dialectic, where there are different possibilities. Is it pro-American in your orientation? A collectivity? I'd like to see an article written about Latin American worldviews used in your research and how these worldviews are formed and how they're actually written into projects. Okay, those are are the you know the major best practices i'd recommend and now i'm going to turn to a few optional practices i'm going to briefly go through these and just introduce them to you many people today especially in the health sciences are beginning to get putting together what's called a planning table or an implementation matrix and this table is really a table that includes mixed methods, but other parts of the study. For example, in a project, we have study aims or questions, data collection, data analysis, outcomes, integration. Put these various components together in one table to give a person uh, an overall view of your project very popular in the health science today. So this is a project for my daughters, a study of unidentified immigrants in the Houston area. She's a Robert Wood Johnson fellow. Uh, she's a, a, a clinical social worker, but she put together this table for her research team. The different four phases of the project, the participants at each phase, the intent of each phase, the data sources, and the key research questions. And basically, they were, she's doing a, 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 an exploratory sequential design, exploring first with a needs assessment, developing a survey instrument, and then using that in training. So once her team saw this diagram, linking together the different parts of her project, quantitative and qualitative, then uh, they could understand her project. So think about this type of an implementation matrix. And you can go to the best practices guidelines from NIH and see several examples of these planning matrices that have been used. Uh, another recommended would, you know, think in terms of quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods, aims, or research questions. Um, I often say in mixed methods research, we need to separate our quantitative and qualitative. We have questions for each. And then we also have a question that addresses the integration of our project, how we're integrating the data. That's the mixed methods question. So this idea came forward from the NIH best practice guidelines that when writing mixed methods have a quantitative aim to determine what you'll learn from your quantitative data collection analysis, a qualitative from your qualitative, and then a mixed methods to determine what we'll learn from our integration. What, what question 
are we trying to answer with our integration? So here's some examples of mixed methods, aims that could be used in a study for the core designs. You know, in a convergent design, we're gonna compare the qualitative interviews and I use example here of elderly self-esteem, the interviews with the survey about their self-esteem. We're gonna compare those two results. That's a mixed methods aim for a conversion design. In the explanatory sequential design, we're gonna explain the quantitative results about self-esteem with qualitative focus groups, explanatory sequential design. And then in exploratory, we're going to explore self-esteem for the elderly. In other words, to understand their viewpoint, then we're going to develop a survey based on their interviews and then administer the contextualized, the, the, the context specific survey instrument. So there we have three aims. Uh, number nine, I've got just two more here. Uh, it's useful to have a conceptual framework or a theory in your design uh, and this theory can inform the quantitative the qualitative or both the quantitative and qualitative and uh, already i showed you this explanatory sequential design where the theory of behavioral change informed the development of the survey and this is a project from one of my colleagues at harvard where she had one framework, one conceptual theory that was used for both the quantitative and the qualitative phases of the project. And then the final one I want to share with you is uh, a data table. If you're going to bring these two databases together, it's helpful to separate them first. And uh, just put together a table that lists your quantitative sources of data. And this is actually from my wife's Japanese study, mixed method study, uh, looking at a behavioral community support program in the area of autism uh, disorder, uh, autism spectrum disorder, ASD. But she had a table much like this, quantitative sources of data and qualitative sources of data. So be very specific about the types of data uh, that you're then going to integrate or bring together there. Okay, so these are the 10 practices. Uh, I've spoken for about an hour here. These first six are extremely important. Uh, we're gonna be putting together some webinars on mixed methods research. Uh, and I may be presenting these from Hawaii in the spring. So you could go to my website, johnwcresswell.com and see uh, what webinars are coming on mixed methods research. These are gonna be very uh, short and inexpensive and perhaps useful webinars. So as I conclude, I wipe my brow here. What fun. So I've really enjoyed making this presentation. Thank you. Okay. Back to Professor Elsa. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think uh, this has been awesome, wonderful. I can I don't have words to express uh, the feeling, and I can. Uh, I would like to share with you that uh, there are many participants expressing their feelings. They are so excited excited to have you here um and right. and you. and it's very nice we have um um uh, one one thousand people here in zoom and we have more than one thousand also in youtube so uh and right. this has been definitely a historic and iconic event uh thank you very much thank so you. um it's my privilege have, to be part uh, of this uh, yeah, <laughs> you are part of our history, so uh, thank, thank you. you very much for 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 being part here. So, um, um, we we have some questions. So the the very very first question that um 
and the Latin American community would like to know is um, it, it will be like uh, let me see what uh, in from your experience creating a networking and research community what would be the possible challenges that our Latin America research community would uh, face if they want to promote the mixed methods research. So now we have uh, an increasing number of people who are working in mixed methods, who are believing in mixed method research. So what would be the, the mm. challenges and what would be your recommendations for the next step for Latin America? Yeah, let me, let me speak about the challenges here. Uh, I think one challenge is to understand the basic ideas of mixed methods research. This is, this is why I began with a very simple diagram of talking about collecting the data and then merging the data and then drawing some insights from it. Um, I think we've become much clearer in the mixed methods field as to what this methodology is and how to present it. And we certainly have many, many more uh, research studies published in journals to help people understand mixed methods research. So that's one, is to really study some of the basic articles and books on mixed methods research. Another challenge is um, collecting both quantitative and qualitative data is sometimes difficult. Um, sometimes uh, the same participants are unwilling to complete instruments or to engage in interviews. And it's a very time consuming process, but uh, the core idea in mixed methods is to collect both form forms of data. And then another aspect is that we've had this Challenge. Another challenge is that we've, we've had this aspect of journals opening up to mixed methods research. We have several journals that are only mixed methods research. The Journal of Mixed Methods Research, International Journal of uh, uh, Multiple Research Approaches, Quantity and Quality. There are several, but now other journals are opening up and uh, as more and more people learn about mixed methods research, I think more journals will open up. But you need to, if you want to publish your mixed methods research, a challenge is to find the appropriate journal that, that's open to mixed methods research. And then in terms of developing mixed methods, your Latin American Association for Mixed Methods Research. You know, I see uh, in the future, uh, some large conferences that would bring people together with people actually reporting their research on mixed methods. I think linking with the International Mixed Methods Association, just like the Caribbean chapter did, is an important step. Also, uh, developing your own uh, Latin American mixed methods journal where you're publishing in Espanol, the key mixed method study, so that people can see how this research is being done on very important topics uh, unique to Latin America. Um, these are some of the, the steps, and these are the steps that the Caribbean Journal followed as they developed. And there are also the steps that the Japanese chapter, Japanese Society for Mixed Methods Research ha has developed. 